Are you blessed this morning? Yes. Of course you are, and you look so blessed. Well, October is National Clergy Appreciation Month, and during this month, we are privileged with the awesome opportunity to seize a moment of heartfelt appreciation, gratitude toward our pastors, the prophetic voices of this house, our leaders, the crazy faith preacher and teacher himself, and his amazing wife. So while you're standing with great enthusiasm and excitement, would you please join me in celebrating and honoring the man and woman of God of this house, Bishop Henry and Pastor Carol Fernandez. Come on, somebody ought to give God an amazing praise for our leaders. Amen, amen, amen. Bishop, Pastor Carol, we certainly celebrate you and honor you for 25 years of service to the Faith Center and to the Kingdom of God. And I pray just as Jesus did, that you continue to increase in stature, wisdom, and favor with God. Thank you for all of us for being that commitment to faith in God and an example, an honorable example of what humility looks like. If you would, please give them a wonderful hand again. Amen, amen. While you're still standing, if you would, join me in celebrating also my beautiful sweetheart, my wife, Katrina. Thank you so much for always standing beside me and supporting my efforts. Thank you so much and supporting my efforts to please God. Are y'all ready for the word? Yes. Wow, y'all sound like it too. All right, let us pray. If you would bow your head. Father, we honor you as the creator and the giver and sustainer of life. We are grateful for the word of faith that will build us and cause us to have an assurance of your creative power. The word of truth that brings understanding and freedom. The word of transformation that will change us. Now, God, I command your word to shift us into our places of destiny and purpose. According to 1 Peter, your word declares, if any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. So God, I thank you for the ability that you have given me to speak and communicate. The ability to minister now, Father, I decrease and I ask you to speak and preach and teach through me so that your glory can be revealed in the name of Jesus. Strengthen us, our dependency on your word. Bring illumination and revelation to our minds. And I declare this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, if you would, take your seat and just tell the person next to you, it's good to see you this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be up here this morning, to be able to deliver what I believe is a word from God. And in the interest of focusing on Pastor's Appreciation Month, I want to speak from the subject of preserving the legacy. Preserving the legacy. And the great and amazing part about this particular message is that I get the opportunity to speak to do two different groups of people. I get to speak to many of you who are classified as the older generation, and then I get to speak to my generation. Now, the interesting thing, I know many of you that's in the older generation, many of you guys look so very young, and I mean, that's an awesome thing. But I'm going to let you identify which group you really fit in. Because I know a lot of older people, and man, every time I turn around, they're talking about how good, how young they feel, and how good they feel, and their looks look very youthful. But let's talk about preserving the legacy. The term legacy is one I'm sure many of us have heard before, but in its basic meaning, it's often associated with the amount of time with the amount of money and property left to someone, and specifically um, in a will or after the point of death. Far too often, though, we associate or th the legacy or the inheritance with wealth that we leave behind. But that word legacy is used so much more broadly than just focusing on financial inheritance and financial wealth. It is also classified as something other than money or property that has to be transferred 
or received from ancestors or predecessors from the past. The process is something has to be transferred over and then someone has to make the conscious decision to receive what has been transferred. When thinking of legacy, I want you to consider future generations. It's similar to a relay race where we pass the legacy to those who follow us, which in turn can pass that same legacy on to others. So the older generation is passing a legacy over to my generation. My generation is in receipt of that legacy and has been tasked with the same obligation to pass it on to future generations. Make sense? Understanding that legacy is to be transferred though, the question then is, what legacy is being transferred to the younger generation? What legacy? Today the church is challenged with winning the hearts and minds of upcoming generation. The young people, the leaders of tomorrow. But both generations have a responsibility. It's the, important to understand that one must be transferred into that position to create success. So when the legacy is transferred, there are certain things that has to be transferred, and those can be positive or negative. But from a positive perspective, when the legacy is transferred, it's supposed to be transferred to create success for the next generation. That's why the question was posed then, what legacy are you personally transferring? Hmm. <laughs> Not only that, but it's important for the younger generation to recognize the importance of being able to carry that legacy and not drop it. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 13, the 13th chapter, verses 7 through 9. And I am going to read from the New Living Translation. Again, that's Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 7 through 9. Do you have it? Amen. The scripture reads, remember, now we're talking, this, this context is speaking to the younger generation. Remember your leaders, for it was they who brought you the word of God. And consider, consider the result of their conduct, the outcome of their godly lives. It's amazing that he specified the type of life to consider. He said godly lives. And then he says, imitate their faith, their conviction that God does exist and is the creator and the ruler of all things, the provider of eternal salvation through Christ, and imitate their reliance on God with absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. And then the eighth verse says, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same yesterday and forever. Do not be carried away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be established and strengthened by grace and not by foods, rules of diet and ritualistic meals, which bring no benefit or spiritual growth to those who observe it. This text is referencing what I call value principles and teachings we have learned that will transition us into our place of purpose and destiny. But it also encourages us to guard ourselves against man-made religion, man-made traditions that focus on human effort but no power through Christ. That's what the text is referring to. He's given us the things to consider as we inherit the legacy imitate he's telling us specifically what to imitate but he's also telling us be careful not to imitate things that add no value and no benefit to your life be mindful that it could be something that look good but it can everything that look good still don't add value so he says in this example when he's talking about the meals he just said listen anything that's ritual that is not scriptural it's something that we tend to make up to make it look like we're doing more than what's really required. But God is warning us as we inherit the legacy, that's not the model that I want you to follow to the younger generation. 
while this is a very different generation and there are recognizable disparities among both generations to my youth and millennials this is it we have the opportunity to learn from our predecessors our seniors and not get distracted by the negativities of what we've seen them doing and I recognize that our generation is very puzzled and challenged because we've seen a lot of the traditions and ritualistic things we've seen the older generation's inability to be transparent because this is a generation that looks for realness and authenticity and I believe that the authenticity is the only thing that will be able to pull our generation toward God to be able to inherit that legacy that is passed down many times we've seen the older generation do things as the text just referred that were non-scriptural but they were traditional sometimes selfish and in many cases did not even accomplish the intent and the purposes or the will of God many conservative and traditional ways of living and engaging the gospel have become obsolete and outdated and it is very apparent that some of the traditional values some seem nowadays incompatible with the needs of the younger people however somebody say however however, however in the midst of all the negativity all these strange rituals and traditions as referenced in the text there are certainly some traditional values that have brought a lot of good that has been demonstrated by the older generation which is now my concern for the younger generation such as <laughs> for example for the older generation they understand the importance of hard work I thought that would be a great place to clap the older generation understands the importance of hard work doing one's best taking pride in one's work even sacrificing their own desires to provide a family or a house for their family put food on the table instead of hanging out with their friends and their homies and their girls they understood the value that no I got to take care of my son I got to take care of my daughter I got to take care of my child they understood how to endure and wait until God transitions them yeah that's the older generation they understood that they worked hard that a lot of them have made so many sacrifices to work hard to provide this generation an opportunity to live in homes that they themselves could not afford years ago many of my generation is experiencing the luxury of what many of the older generation could not experience because they were steady working they were plowing fields they were doing things that in my opinion many of the people in my generation wouldn't even give thought to doing <laughs> but that's the need to pass the baton because while I'm very concerned for my generation because I feel that we live in a world that's so technologically advanced that everything is quick everything is self gratification give me what I want when I want it how I want it but can I tell you that when it comes to the receipt of inheriting a legacy the example that I will give you is like if I gave you a million dollars and that was your inheritance after someone has passed away if you have not learned the basic values of storing your money saving your money being frugal with your money paying your tithes and offering what was a million dollars today will soon be diminished and depleted so my concern is that when we inherit the legacy anything that God promised you and blesses you with it is the will of God that when you inherit it that you will sustain what he gives you you got to remember we do not serve a God of regression but a God that is mobile he's constantly moving he's a God that's constantly progressing and what happens is from every stage in life you transition from one stage to the next and then you learn how to be stable there and while you're stable guess what the words are I'm learning how to grow I'm learning how to love I'm learning how to develop the character that I need to transition to the next stage it's what the younger generation but there are some great things about this younger generation that I'll get to shortly 
But in the interest of this legacy, a baton must be passed. And we must understand that the baton will be transferred over voluntarily or involuntarily by the transitions of seasons. If you would, in the book of Psalms 78 and 4, you don't have to turn to it, but I'm going to read it. In Psalms 78 and 4, it says, speaking of the older generation, we will not hide them. It's talking about prior in that text. It talks about the teachings that they were taught. And it says, we will not hide them from our children. But we would tell the generation to, to come the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord and tell of his great power and his wonderful works that he has done. Now here's the key point in those scriptures. Number one, God commanded the stories of his mighty acts to be passed down from, the, from one generation to the next. That's a commandment from God that we pass down the good deeds of what God has done. The second thing that the text reveals is that we are to help each generation obey God and set their hope on him. And number three, it is important to keep the younger people from repeating the mistakes of the ancestors. Now, we understand that we can learn and grow, but it's not always necessary to repeat the wrong thing over and over again. The more you keep repeating things that are wrong, the more you keep delaying your progress. The more you keep delaying and see what happens is when God is saying, listen, by this point you should be here, but because you haven't seized the moment to develop and grow and learn, you're missing your moment and you're delayed. But I always like talking about delay in 2016, Bishop, because it's declared that you have accelerated growth. If you will seize the moment to learn and grow, God will accelerate the process and give you some grace. <laughs> in Joshua 4, 21 and 22, it says, he said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel cross over the dry ground. The important principle here is to understand that it's important to tell the next generation the importance and the traditions of certain valuables that were scriptural. So then when we see things happening, we begin to ask questions, well, why did you guys do that? We want to know with transparency why you did what you did. And when you did it, what type of outcome did it produce for you? The baton. By definition, a baton is referred to as a stick, a rod, a staff, or a short bar. The baton. Somebody say the baton. Here's the examples that I will give you about the use of a baton. Number one, in an orchestra, it's used to indicate rhythm or expression. In law enforcement, it's used as a weapon. In athletics, when you're in a relay race, it is transferred to the next runner at the end of each stage. The baton is also classified as a staff carried by an official as a symbol of authority. The Greek origin of the word states that it should carry and lift up a generation. It should carry and lift up a generation. Now, when you consider the examples that I just gave you then, then that lets us know then when one generation passes the baton, the baton is supposed to serve a purpose. Meaning that, number one, the baton serves as a source of rhythm which helps us stay on a particular track and at a certain pace to experience success. Number two, it is the source of connection and identity from one generation to the next. But it is also, like with in law enforcement weaponry, it is also a source of comfort and a sense of strength um, when it comes to your protection. But it also represents a symbol of authority. What I'm revealing to you now are the characteristics that you should have. The culture, when it's passed down from one generation to the next, what the scripture is revealing are all of these different examples that the baton, that the older generation is surpassed to the younger generation. It should be a source of all of those different aspects. But let me take it a step further because what really got me was when I realized that the baton was also classified as a staff. And the first thing that came to mind was when Moses used his staff and his rod to part the Red Sea. 
In other words, if you cannot see your way clear, and there appears to be a blockage like it was for the children of Israel, and they needed to cross over into the promised land, God told Moses, stretch out your staff, stretch out your rod. And it was that rod that Moses stretched out that God used as a miracle working power. It was a tool to produce something that only God can make a way for them to cross over. In other words, when the baton is passed down through receiving the legacy, there should be miracles and signs associated with what God is doing in the next generation. And when that baton is passed over, when it's passed over and it's used properly and the power of the baton is not mismanaged, but it's used properly, that means to tell the younger generation that even when you seem like you can't come through, even when it seemed like hell is facing you, if you would use the baton. I, I, I feel like I'm ahead of myself, but uh, in the scripture, the baton really is the power of the word. If you get yourself rooted in God's word. The word of God that produces, the word of God that separates, the word of God that'll make a way when there appears to be no way. The word of God that's full of life. Because Moses also used that same rod and that same staff to strike it and it produced water for the children of Israel. The miracle working power of the baton. Man, this is a powerful baton. Woo! I go back to the question from the very beginning. What then are you leaving behind? To the older generation, what then, what legacy are you passing down to this next generation? To my parents, what are you passing down to your children so that they can be children and youth and millennials of courage, power, and operate in their authority in their generation? <laughs> Woo! Yes, sir. This is blessing me. So as a believer in Christ, consider what spiritual legacy you would pass down when you hand over the baton. Our baton, baton is the sum of all the lessons, insights, wisdom, counsel, character, and spiritual anointings that we have gained. And we see it throughout the Bible. When David passed the baton to Solomon's generation, Elijah to Elisha, Paul to Timothy, Jesus to his disciples, and the one that we all should be proud about, Jesus passed it to us. That same baton was passed to us. Woo, is this blessing you? So let's talk about the preparation to position and preserve this legacy. Hebrews, the sixth chapter and the 12th verse says, this is to my younger generation. Hebrews 6 and 12, it says, that you not be lazy. Uh, Y'all need me to say that again? Uh, don't be lazy, get up and do something. That's really what the scripture is saying that ye not be lazy, but followers of them who through faith. Somebody say faith. Faith, faith and patience have inherited the promise. Do not be lazy, but followers of them who through faith and patience has inherited the promise. So what that's, what that's really telling us is that in order, two main criteria for inheriting the promise is, number one, you got to walk by faith. You got to believe. You got to believe that what God has made available to you actually belongs to you. And when you believe that it belongs to you, you'll position yourself to go get it. And when you position yourself to go get it, you'll stay in a place to maintain the promise that God gave to you. So he says, but don't be lazy. It comes with sacrifice. Just like the older generation had to sacrifice, we got to work and sacrifice and do some things now. Position ourselves to preserve the legacy. But he says, through faith and patience, that means wait. I, I can't tell you how waiting to be developed has helped me so much in my life. I am where I am today because I learned how to wait. I learned how to grow and watch from predecessors. I learned how to soak up all the moments of mentoring that I had available. There were people who mentored me one-on-one, -on -one, and there were people that I watched from afar off that I never met, but I say, you're my mentor because I'm learning how to wait until God positions me because what I cannot afford to do is get what God belong, God has for me and then drop it and lose it because if I lose it I might not be able to pick it back up again 
So he says, wait. So while all of these things are happening in the generation, here's what I'm excited about with this generation is the excitement about our generation and the spontaneity and the creativity of our generation. This generation is so creative. Like when you look at technology, it is amazing to see how far we have come when it comes to technology. Most, y'all notice that uh, most people don't even bring physical Bibles to church? That's technology. Now, when it comes to studying, I still use my, my regular Bible because I'm still old school when it comes to taking notes. But we have so much creativity. We're able to come up with so many technologies and, and new methodologies to proclaim the gospel. We are global and out-of-the-box thinkers with a broader view of how to reach the world for Jesus Christ. The key to all this creativity and technology is that we are never to change the message of the gospel or taint it. In teaching the gospel and spreading the gospel, the message is what it is. It's not going to change to make it convenient for us. You got to make a conscious decision that no matter how comfortable it is, no matter how much people talk about you or look at you crazy, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to teach it because at the end of the day, the God who called me is the same God that gave me the authority to walk in it. So I'm going to walk in boldness and I'm going to walk in confidence to do what God has called me to do. But we can't change the message. Because the Bible does not give a description of how to present it. So while we can't change the message, we can certainly change how we present the message. We don't have to stick to the standards of what the older generation did in terms of how they delivered the message of God. In order to reach this global generation, you got to be a global thinker. You got to think so far out of the box. You got to think of things that you have never done to be able to reach the gospel. Why do you think Facebook Live is what it is today? It's another form of, it's, we know it's used for many different things, but it can be a platform to be able to share the gospel to a younger generation because most people, you know, when you look at the statistics, the millennials are leaving the church by the thousands. And the statistics say that they're leaving church by the thousands because most of them think church is boring. Most think church is boring, most think church is tr tr um, too traditional, and most think that the older generation is not transparent. Most think when they come to church that they're going to be judged. They're going to be looked at a certain way, and they can't come into church a certain way, but if you remember, the church is still the hospital. So we expect for everybody to enter in and get healed to get delivered. So it really doesn't matter what your background is or what your, your, your struggle or your challenge is. God wants you to be in the church, get developed in the church, and then go out and proclaim the gospel. Yeah. Is this blessing you? Yeah. I'm almost done, y'all. Therefore, we have to adjust and adapt to properly influence and carry the legacy of the gospel in a relevant and effective way. It is necessary to present any messages uh, differently from generation to generation. For example, when you look at car rental companies, all of them rent cars, but what makes one more outstanding than the next is simply how they present the car that they offer. It is the presentation that they give that will determine, well, I'm gonna buy from this company versus this company. And the interesting thing, where they all have cars, they still serve one purpose, it's a vehicle. It is designed to transport you from one location to the next. But it serves the same purpose, meaning that guess what? We don't change the original design and intent of the car, but we do change how we present it, why? Because I wanna attract a different customer base. And if you know anything about business, when you attract a customer base, you wanna retain your customers. So that means in the interest of retaining your customers, you always have to do a self-assessment of, is what I'm using today, is it working today? Because what worked 30 years ago may not work today. Think about what then, what legacy are you leaving behind? So here's what I'm going to leave you with. How to position yourself to the younger people. Number one, have respect for your seniors, elders, and the older generation. Now, I'm going to park right there for one second. I am so big on respect. Even in the youth ministry, I tell them all the time, one thing that is critically important to me is that we all respect one another. Respect will open doors that money can't buy. Respect, respect will keep you living. There's a lot of people that's dead and gone because they didn't respect somebody. 
I may not agree with you, but I will respect you. I may not understand your lifestyle, but I'm going to respect you at the end of the day. Respect. Respect your, older, your elders and the older generation, those that have taught you along the way. Prepare and equip yourself in the Word. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says, Study to sow thyself approved unto God, a workman not needing to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to park right there for a second too for my, older, for my younger generation. Study to, self, study to show yourself approved not unto your mom and your daddy. Not unto the ones that you think are judging you and criticizing you. You need to get into the word for your own development. Don't, at the end of the day, when you get into the work, there's only one person that's going to be able to judge your quality of, of life and, your stu and that's God himself. No one can give an account on your behalf. You got to get into the word of God for yourself. So the Bible says study to show yourself approved. And then it's important to understand that in Ecclesiastes 12 and 1, the Bible says, remember now thy night when thy shall say, I have no pleasure in them. Because the evil days are drawing nigh. Maximize your moment of youthfulness right now. You're going to get old one day. And I'm not there because I just turned 34 today, so I still ain't there. But you're going to get, we're going to get old, y'all. So we got to do what we can while we're young, while we're able to move, while we're able to get up, travel, and proclaim the gospel while you can. You ain't going to be able to do all this stuff that the older generation is not able to do at this moment. Make your strength available to God while you're young. And I said all of that to say, this is why in the month of October, while we're celebrating Pastor's Appreciation Month and Day, young people must see and understand that our leader, Bishop Henry Fernandez and Pastor Carroll, and how God has used them tremendously over the years to, to found this ministry, develop many of the older generation that is sitting in here today. Many of the middle-aged school parents, a lot of the individuals that are in here today, they are in here, and over the years, Bishop and Pastor Carroll has poured into them certain teachings of faith, certain empowering teachings of love. That's what they've done over the years to their guardians. And it was all so that we could adhere to the commitment of nullifying all negative predictions of our young people, helping to rewrite the future. It was so that we could proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, reach the world for Jesus Christ through empowers of hope, teachings of hope, faith, salvation, and the proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord, head of the church, and son of God the Father. Everything that we do here at the Faith Center and what Bishop Fernandez has done, it is all centered in the interest of promoting Jesus Christ. So that's why we have to prepare ourselves to carry on the legacy. Receive the baton. That's why what, I'm, what I taught on today, it cannot happen unless there's a partnership between one generation and the next. I challenge this older generation. I challenge all of you that are in the older generation. Position us to be successful. Be authentic with us. Be real with us. Help us navigate our way into the promise. Be transparent with us. Give us the tools and the resources that we need to survive. But I also challenge the younger generation. Be stable. Sit and learn. Take the learnings that you receive and put them into practice. Implement them. Ask questions that's going to help you. Observe. Wait. Let God grow you and develop you so that when the baton is handed over to you and when you transition into your legacy or into your promise, you'll be able to keep it and not lose it. You know, that's why we're here. You know, even when we consider the youth center, our vision is all centered around how do we preserve the legacy of what Bishop and Pastor Carol has founded. As parents, what legacy are you passing to your kids? When you send them over to the youth center, it is not only about fun, 
This is about wholeness and development in every part of their life. We don't just want them to be sound in the Word of God. That's number one. But when they transition into life, we want them to be citizens that make a meaningful and purposeful contribution to society. One of purpose, to be confident in who they are. We want them to be able to manage relationships and friendships appropriately. We want them to be dreamers. Go after what they desire. Go get what belongs to them. Take it by force. But it requires the passing down of quality information through the legacy. Preserving the legacy. Was this a blessing to you? Ah, bless the Lord.